My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, first things first, uh, thank the committee for having me here and um, treating us real good since we got here. So I thank you for the kind invitation. And the speakers, uh, you guys knocked it out of the park. Uh, in fact, I really don't have anything to add, so let's close with the Lord's Prayer we get out of here. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's been great sitting there um, listening to some really great stories. And I know Jimmy uh, many years now, uh, about 100 gray hairs ago, I met Jimmy. And um, so it's just it's great to be here with uh, you and Maribeth. You know, um, the longer I'm sober, thank you, God, uh, the, lo the more I realize um, how this journey really comes out to relationships. Uh, the value of relationships and cleaning up old scrapes and trying to amend those things and, and fix those, those broken fences along the way because what, maybe it's because I'm getting older, I don't know, uh, hopefully awakened a little bit, but um, we're here for a vapor. It's a breath and we're out. And the time goes fast, and the longer you're, you're around here, you realize, oh my God, it's been 10 years, 20 years, and, and, we're, and get a little bit older. And there's great reflection. And, and I don't ever want to look back and, and have that, that arrow in my side when I see someone, um, that uncomfortability when I think of someone because life is just too short. And, and the, the, the good thing is I get to uh, experience wonderful relationships. Um, spending a weekend with Jimmy and Meribeth and seeing Dean and Amy and Chip and Angie. And it's just kind of like the heads of the five families came together this weekend. It's a, um, but if you're from Brooklyn, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a tourist, I'll explain to you after the meeting. Um, but relationships, they're incredibly important. And, and the relationships I allow in my life, if you will, uh, being well enough uh, to kind of put some space between maybe me and someone who isn't so kind and so loving, but forgive them walking away. And I actually had to do that with a sponsor recently. Uh, I have a home group, it's called Just For Now Group, and my sponsor, the same sponsor Jimmy has, is Bobby out of, out of Minnesota. And um, there was a time on this path where I realized the sponsor, and sponsor relationship was getting a little toxic and I prayed to God and it was time to move on. And it's just, I, and I feel enriched in that because there was a time in my life I allow you to, you know, step all over me and then apologize when you were done. And what Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me is not maybe some self-worth, but really a whole lot of relationship with God, the most important relationship I'm ever going to have. And so if I'm not right with you, it's because I'm not right with me and I'm not right with me because I'm not right with God and somehow I get right with God and everything works out okay. I have enough in here, enough soul food, enough spiritual muscles to discern what's unhealthy and healthy. And the folks that are no longer around me anymore, I don't walk away begrudgingly, but I walk away with a spirit of forgiveness. Because if they ever call me, I need to be on the ready to go 12-step them. And even those folks perhaps I never got along with, if they do call me to say, can you sponsor me? I need to say yes and not be harboring an old grudge. So personal relationships have become incredibly important to me. For me to practice fidelity to God and put not money, property, and prestige before God, not a reputation before God, put nothing, even my career before God, that to me is the most important relationship. My big book tells me that we're, he's the principal, we're his agent, we represent God. God gives me that honor to go out and represent him. How am I doing with that? Not in an AA meeting because everyone gets a passing grade here. It's when I'm in Publix or on 95 driving in traffic or I'm in the, in, in, at work. How do I look? Am I, am I a walking prayer? And I'll tell you on the front end, I do none of this perfect. I make more mistakes than you could imagine. But this forgiving God puts me back in the saddle again. But am I a walking prayer? See, I can pray. I can look like I'm praying. If you're listening, it sounds like I'm praying. But as soon as I get up off my knees, I go from, from Moses to Rambo, and it doesn't look like a prayer anymore. <laughs> I'm back out there and doing what I need to do to get to work, to get to the supermarket, to get to the, to the sponsor's house, to get to the phone, whatever it is. And that's not a walking prayer. That's back to me being self-reliant, and I'll have God when I need him. Am I a walking prayer? And over and over and over again, what this journey has shown me is the importance of a relationship with God. 
And so hopefully I'm doing a good job and I get an A on his report card. I come from God, I belong to God, I'll return to him one day. And while I'm here for this short time, I hope I'm doing his work while I'm here. And God put me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a member of my church and I'm a good member, a member of good standing there. But he put me here. But I do everything along with, not instead of. And I hope I'm doing a good job here to be a member of good standing and uphold and support our traditions and be in touch with the tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got sober in Brooklyn. Someone saw me in the hallway and said, you got to share the fishing story. And I, I really don't want to, but I'm going to share the fishing story uh, if they're still here. Uh, I got sober in Brooklyn, New York, uh, an area called Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York. If any of you old guys remember Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta, uh, you see the hairdo. Um, <laughs> that's where I got sober. That's where I grew up. I mean, there were guys there in my first home group who thought The Godfather was an educational movie when I arrived. And uh, some of those guys changed how it works and thought, how you doing? Um, (laughs) I'm I'm not lying, that's what's really scary. so they decided to go fishing. I was in Minnesota for a whole year uh, in treatment. I went from New York and Long Island, New York. They sent me out to Minnesota. I lived out there for a year. And when I came home, I was brought to the Free Spirit Group, my first home group, where the only requirement for membership there is a pinky ring, sunglasses, and gold jewelry. And um, yeah, so they decided to go fishing one day. I was the new kid on the block is we're going to go fishing to this area called Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, which was a little uh, uh, shipping area, uh, a lot of boats and fishing and things like that. It was a cool town town back in the day. And so uh, how do five guys from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, get dressed to go fishing? Like I'm dressed tonight, by the way. (laughs) And so there were guys like uh, Sally Pleat, Sal Pacino, um, Tony News, Big Danny, Little Danny, Danny Muscles, Danny Tattoos, Joey Bag of Donuts, Frankie Head of Lettuce. These were the gurus that were put in my life at the beginning. And so five of us set sail on this little boat to go fishing. Now, none of us have ever been fishing. I don't even know what the hell I'm doing out there. Jimmy knows I get on a boat, I get really claustrophobic. There I was. And uh, about two hours into this, Sally Boy catches something. And he's pulling it on. We're all cheering him on. We have no idea if he's got jaws, what he's got. And he finally gets this little fish on board. And you know what it does. It's flipping and flapping all over the deck. So what do these five guys do? They start throwing punches and kicks at the fish. <laughs> and finally, Sally Boy grabs the fish like in a bear hug and leans over the deck and sticking this to fish's head underwater. I said, Sally, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to drown him. <laughs> If you're out there, I told the fishing story. I didn't embellish at all on that story, by the way. But those are the type of spiritual gurus God put in my path to get sober with. How I'm here, I have no idea. Um, I spent 10 years in therapy over guys like that. But Jimmy was talking about something earlier that was uh, just so on, on point. A lot of those guys weren't big bookers. But they were good old boys in AA. And there was just a spirit about them. They knew you were new. You know when you're new and you come in, you try to front like you're around 20 years, they go, you're new. And they blow your cover. And they knew I was the new kid on the block. And it was the meeting in the car before the meeting, the get in the car line, the meeting in the car after the meeting. And they would talk about AA. They would talk about life. They would cut up. But you were part of a, a, a group of guys. And the old time is they knew when you walked in the door, sit with us. And they didn't give me big book information. They gave me love because I wasn't feeling too good about me back then. In fact, when I was living in Minnesota, the same thing happened. I was wearing my brother's clothes. I had nothing. Uh, I had my brother's pants on. I wear a size 10 shoe. He sent me a size eight sneakers and I was trying to get into them because I had nothing else. I had maybe one shirt and a jacket and it was winter time in Minnesota, but they didn't care about that. They just knew I was new and they welcomed me. And the same thing with those guys back in Brooklyn. They did the same exact thing. There was a great spirit about that. And I, if I allow me a little latitude, what I experience a lot of is more people interested in information and speaking than standing by the door a shoemaker says, I'm waiting for the new guy and pour him a cup of coffee and let's go in the back and let's talk for a couple of hours. That's the primary purpose. Stay sober and help another alcoholic achieve sobriety. That drunk doesn't care I speak a whole bunch out of the year. He's not interested in that. He doesn't care what I do for a living. What he cares about, how am I going to get through tonight without a drink because I'm dying and I need to be the helping hand there. 
the hand of AA. So uh, Jimmy talked about that beautifully, and I sat there, and it, it was just it just warmed my heart that we still hold on to those those glorious days, and which means we can still bring them into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, these folks put this conference together, but tomorrow it ends, and Monday we'll go to our home group, and we're back to working with another drunk and putting the coffee on and turning the light on and waiting for the new guy to come in or the new lady to come in. That's what we do. And for this, I'm forever grateful to be a member of this, this sacred fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I call it sacred, and I do for me, because to me, it is a sacred fellowship. I've watched, I've heard enough stories over the years, I've seen with my own eyes, and heard with my own ears, the lives get reborn and resurrected for fun and for free, and Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't need an insurance policy, I don't need to be the right color, I don't need to be a financial bracket, I just need to say help, and we say come on in. I got a desire not to drink. Come on, and we don't care about anything else. And then we stick around and we watch that young and get in here. And he or she gets a sponsor. And in six months, they got their little sponsees. And then they get in a one-year corner. You know this thing works. We are sacred in Alcoholics Anonymous, all in the hands of God. And what I've also learned is that my sobriety that God has given to me, I don't take for granted. It's a very fragile gift sobriety. Because alcoholism is dying to just punch a hole in there and pull me right out. My alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle of whiskey. I thought it did for a long time. My alcoholism sits right up here in the head. And this head will override everything that's good and make it bad, except God. So the spiritual walk I get to do and I get to pass on. June 23rd, 1988, was a loving God separated me from alcohol. I'm very grateful for this gift of sobriety. And the longer I'm sober, as uncomfortable as it has been at times, I'm very grateful for the things God has removed from my life. The things I thought I really needed to stay sober, really the things I thought I really needed to make me a better man, were the very things that were getting in my way and God kept removing. And this process of removal is what Alcoholics Anonymous is about, not giving, not adding, because everything I need to do this life, I was given when I popped out of Mamre on July 14th, 1959. God gave me all the tools, and what I did by the time I was 14, I screwed them all up. And by the time I was 28, I'm living in an abandoned building uh, in lower Manhattan, homeless, bum, panhandling for money. God didn't do that to me. It was at my own hand. June 23rd, 1988, I, 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 I land in this abandoned building in an area in lower Manhattan called Alphabet City. And it was Avenue A, B, C, and D. And at the time, it was a very, very sordid spot. Folks who couldn't get out financially were stuck there. And the rest of the neighborhood was filled up with winos, junkies, and the crack scene hit. It was a sordid spot. And if I live to be 100, I'll never be as old as a day. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. I wind up living in the back of this building, this hallway in this abandoned building because I was too feeble to fight. At that point, I weighed about 130 pounds. I had uh, blood-stained soil pants on. I, I had construction boots, and the right boot was missing the front. The sweat socks were black. My fingernails were filthy. My hair was filthy. I hadn't bathed in a long time. I have hepatitis C, and I'm urin urinating blood, and I'm dying of alcoholism. And a 10-year-old could have knocked me on my back. The streets were incredibly hot. The police were sweeping up everything at the time to clean it up. And I knew if I go to jail again, if I get arrested this time, I'm going to go to prison. I've never been to prison, thank you, God. But I've been arrested a lot of times, and I was knocking on the door to go to prison this time. So I hide out in an abandoned building. And I think about that, what I was reduced to. Not that I was incredibly comfortable living in an abandoned building. I know where I am, but I, sought, I found some sort of refuge sleeping in the back of an abandoned building. Like no one's going to bother me here. The police rarely roll through there unless it was a 911. A couple of junkies or crackheads or winos would show up. They didn't want any problems. And that's where I said, and these were my people now. See, I hit a bottom like I move in. This is how I do this. And then something indeed miraculous happened to me in June of 88. My current sponsor heard him share this for a long time, and I questioned him one time, what does that mean when we get surrendered? I didn't quit drinking on June 23rd, 1988. I didn't decide to come to Alcoholics Anonymous on June 23rd, 1988. I tried AA, always drunk. I knew this was a cult and it didn't work. It was for very good, upstanding, rich people. 
of the right color. That's who came to Alcoholics Anonymous, not a bum like me. I knew treatment centers didn't work because I had six under my belt already, and I tried my religious community. I'm a cradle Catholic, and I knew that didn't work. And God removed all of that to get my attention. And what happened to me on that particular day, June 23rd, 1988, I didn't even know it was the month of June, by the way. I'm being honest with you. When I got into my seven treatment center, you know, if you've ever been to treatment, they have those intake admissions people, and they're always happy, <laughs> which really annoyed the hell out of me. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. It's June 23rd, 1988. I'm, I'm looking to kill somebody, and that's how I knew it was June 23rd, 1988. But in this hallway, um, I had that moment of clarity, yeah? And I remember getting up off the floor because I would come to, the hands were shaking, the belly was upset, I'm cold and sweating at the same time. I didn't know I'm going through withdrawal all the time. And I'm drinking just to breathe, basically. And then it hit me. That if I get a drink in me right now, I'm probably going to die. It was the first time in my life I didn't want that. And if I don't get a drink, I'm going to die. And I felt as if I need help taking the next breath. I was not thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I was not thinking about treatment. I was not thinking about church. I wasn't thinking about anything other than this. God, please take me from this. I don't want to die. I was brought down to as raw as God could make me in that moment. There wasn't a hurry to get back. There wasn't a job to get back. There was nothing. I was a bum on the street. And in that place, where I wasn't even given time to wallow in self-pity, like, oh my God, I did it again. What am I going to do? Because the ego loves that stuff. The poor me's. I'll get a drink to wash this away. I'll figure it out tomorrow. None of that was there. It was all removed. I was as raw as raw can be. It doesn't feel good. It didn't feel godly. It didn't sound godly at all. I, if you would have told me this is a God moment, I'd say, you're crazy, because it didn't feel that way. But waking up sometimes is just that way, when everything gets removed, and I've experienced that in sobriety. And in that moment, I begged God to help. And I began to weep, really uncontrollably, weeping. I had no idea what was going on with me. I cannot stop crying. As Jimmy said earlier, we live life forward and understand it backwards. It was years of purging. I hadn't wept since my mom uh, uh, passed away when I was 14 years old. This is like 14, 15 years later, and the dam burst. And I look back on it, it was years of betrayal, years of alcoholism, years of violations, just a lot of things. And the dam broke, and when we get split open is when God's light can shine in. It didn't sound godly, nor did it feel godly, but it was my first contact. God, if you will, reintroduced himself to me in something called a gift of desperation, where my desperation screamed louder than the ego for a moment. I was split wide open, and when the big book says we were beaten into a state of reasonableness, and 100% hopeless apart from divine help. When someone's reasonable, we can negotiate with them. We can talk to them. When someone's not reasonable, like my first six treatment centers, there's no talking to me. But that's what this thing did to me. It beat me to a place of, I will do anything not to be this anymore. I'm willing to exchange everything I think I know for something new. Because this is killing me. I can't do it anymore. I was tired. Our big book says on page 43, we're 100% hopeless apart from divine help. I probably read that line a million times. And one day I'm reading it and it just stopped me right where I was. 100% hopeless apart from divine help. What a powerful line. I think everyone in this room has been there, whether it's Park Avenue or Park Bench. It's that moment where I realize even the people I love and adore can't keep me sober. Even my home group and my sponsor in this big book in the treatment centers, my priest, my rabbi, they can't keep me sober. There's only one who could, and I better get a relationship with, with him now. That doesn't feel good, but it's a moment where the ego gets grinded into dust and the ego takes a backseat and spirit starts to breathe. And I start to have things happen to me that I couldn't plan on my best day. And God begins to connect the dots. What happened to me on that particular day? My dad was in a town called Atlantic City, New Jersey, spending some time with his wife. We hadn't seen each other for a really long time. I hadn't seen my family for a long time. And around 2.30 in the morning, as he told me, he says he was jawed out of his sleep at around 2.30 in the morning. He didn't call it God back then. He does now. And he said, something told me to go look for you. Now, from Atlantic City to Lower Manhattan, it's a few-hour drive. 
And he had an idea where I was. And he left his wife there, got dressed, and around 2.30 in the morning, he heads from, from uh, South Jersey all the way into Lower Manhattan, looking, driving through the streets to find me. And there I am, the sun's up, and I'm standing on a street corner. And you know when you got the shakes going on, I'm vibrating. I'm dying. And I'm standing on a street corner, and he finds me, gets out of the car, walks across the street. And the very first thing I tell my old man is, I'm okay. I'm okay. Not hello, how are you? Can you loan me a few bucks? Nothing. He got to me, and I went limp. I collapsed. I collapsed in his arms. I'll never forget this. And my dad, I remember him holding me up. Now, as far as that kind of proximity, physically and emotionally, we hadn't had that since I'm probably a five-year-old kid. We just walked two different paths. My dad's the alpha male from South Brooklyn. If anyone's ever seen the movie Goodfellas, that Robert De Niro guy, I thought it was an autobiography about my old man. That's him. I was into hippies and music. We did not get along. And as he's holding me up, he keeps repeating something. I'm not going to lose my son to this. I'm not going to lose my son to this over and over and over again. And there was a little moment there where I realized, oh my God, I can't believe I'm hu hugging my dad. And my dad's hugging me. And he's not hollering at me. He's not in a rage about me. He's not threatening my life again. There was something tender about it. I hope I never lose that memory. And I was placed in my seven treatment center. And I get to talk to you about the good news, what's happened to me over 33 years. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I grew up in Brooklyn, and my first drink came. I was around 14 years old. And uh, back in, uh, Jimmy was talking about it earlier, back in Brooklyn, I remember uh, growing up, it was, it was a pretty cool time. We had our problems in the 60s. I mean, if you're old enough to remember, we had the stuff going on. For me, it's pale in comparison to the nonsense going on now, but we had our stuff going on. But there was something cool about growing up in the 60s. God gave me a few gifts. One of them was music. I was a gifted little musician. I mean, I, I, I started out playing drums and I got into a lot of things. I was the type of kid where if you gave me an instrument in a week or two, I'd play it. I just knew how to do it. And my family wanted to send me to um, Juilliard Music School and they knew they had something. In fact, I was the kid in the neighborhood who was going to make it out. I was going to make it out of the neighborhood via music. So I got lots of accolades, lots of applause for what I was doing, playing professionally at a young age, but I still never felt okay in this body. I never felt okay about being me. I was not okay. I had a mom at home who was full-blown alcoholic, addicted to every narcotic you can think of, had some psych issues, and this poor woman, her name was Josephine, by the way, this poor woman tried about a half, of a, a, half a dozen times to take her life because the pain of living that life was so great. That's what people like me do. We look just to blow our brains out or just take too much of something, go to sleep and never wake up. About a half a dozen times she tried and in January 1974, she succeeded. And I remember my dad on a 911 call. It was the first time I heard my dad cry. And he was wailing over a 911 call, please come, I think my wife is dead. And I was, I was in the lower bunk with me and my two younger brothers. And have you ever been frozen in fear where you can't move? You just can't move your body. I hear it, but I can't move. And my chest was pounding. She did it this time. She really did it. And here's a woman who taught me how to pray, took me to all my religious instructions, loved the carpenter, would tell me how much God loves us, all things are possible, and this great promise of this God, but I'm watching her get sicker and sicker, and now I know she's gone. What about this God? And I don't think I made a conscious decision to walk away from God, but now I had huge skepticism and doubt and hate towards this God for doing this to my mother. And I was cast into the sea, basically, like many of us, of self-reliance. I'll figure it out as I go along. But God is for women and children. God isn't for men. I need to man up now. And I kind of went numb to everything. And no matter how much non-conference approved dry goods I would put in my body, no matter how much alcohol I put in my body, I was not okay. I could not, it would not erase the pain that deep pain in here that I can't get rid of. My alcoholism loves to attach itself to that. 
So at 14 years old, the guys are drinking a cold 45 beer on the corner. It was a cool time. We listened to rock and Motown back in the day. It was before disco and MTV ruined everything. It was a cool time. And they were listening to music. And, you know, I watched these guys, you know, rough house, you know, talk to the pretty girls. And they just seemed to be having a good time. I love the effect produced in them by them drinking uh, cold 45 beer. How do you get there? At 14 years old, I'm not okay. You know, when a book talks about being restless and discontent, that's putting it mildly. I'm driven by fear. No matter where I go, there I am. I'm not okay. And at 14 years old, I'm not okay. And I say that for this reason, because when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous at around 28 years old, sober, I'm still not okay. I'm physically sober and I'm still not okay. With me? As why am I not okay? I'm not drinking. I'm not taking the other stuff. Why am I not okay? Because my alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle of whiskey. My alcoholism sits right up in here. And it was looking to do what it always did. Pay any price tomorrow to seek comfort right now. I'll figure it out tomorrow. And so I put my hand in there, I grabbed a quart of beer, and I began to drink. And I'm embarrassed to tell you, but halfway through a quart of beer, I'm feeling numb. I'm feeling wonderful. I'm feeling euphoric. All that pain of losing my mom, the fear of my dad removed. I got to be about as tall as Jimmy. I had muscles. All of every girl on the corner wanted me. <laughs> Why are you laughing for? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Some of the guys might identify with you. You know when you're drinking and you, she, you swear she looks like, like Bo Derek. And then you come to the next morning, she looks like Bo Diddley, and you wonder how you got to that chair. I've had a few of those. <laughs> Halfway through a quart of beer, I'm feeling wonderful. This is great. Now I know why they drink. Bill says it best, I had arrived. I showed up for life. I wasn't afraid anymore. I was okay with being me. I thought I was something. I was like Dirty Harry meets Snoop Dogg rolled into one. It was, a, it was the coolest thing. And by the time I finished a quart of beer, I'm drunk. It's my first drunk. I'm drunk. And it was euphoric. I remember everything. But somewhere during the night, the guys called it a night, and I had to head home. And then I remember this. As I was walking, uh, my house was situated in the middle of the block as I'm getting close to my house. I didn't want to go home that night. First of all, it's where dad lives. I don't want to see him. I don't like him. I know he don't like me. And I know I, I'm drunk, so I'm going to get the riot act. I don't want to deal with him. It's where mom died. We were still there. And here was the big reason. I realized at that moment, I tasted the honey that night. I tasted drunk for the first time. I never want to be sober again. I don't do well sober. I don't do well just with being dry. I'm a raw nerve, everything hurts. I'm fear-based, insecure, egotistical, narcissistic. Everyone's a problem. Everyone's a problem. I'm not okay. You're not okay. Nothing's okay. I need some relief. So what alcoholism will do is go underground and resurface in other areas, sex sprees, food sprees, money sprees, gambling sprees, just something to make me deal with this. I'm not okay right here. I don't want to go to school on Monday morning sober. I never want to go to school again sober. I want to walk into school with this kind of feeling. And all my dad, I remember him saying things like, don't become like me, he would say. He says, keep playing music, stay out of trouble, do study and do a couple of chores. That's not a tall order, but suddenly doing it sober, what an order, I can't go through it. I don't want to do sober anymore. I want to be drunk for eternity. And I chased that elusive feeling, as our book says, for a long time, as many of us know, to almost death in, in jails and institutions. That's where my alcoholism takes me. It never tells me that when I'm about to pick up the first drink. So I never picked up the first drink drunk. I always picked up the first drink sober. And I bought the lie, we're only going to have one. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. We're not going to get that bad. We won't get in trouble. But I'm an alcoholic. I pick up the first drink. I got to have a second drink because for me, the cravings always intensified. It was never satisfied. And then the third drink seems to be ordered for me. I got to have a third drink. And then I'm drunk. And at that point, who cares? But I was only going to have one over and over and over again. 
And so I chased this feeling on weekends. And then weekends rolled into during the week. And you know, progression does what progression does. Like a crescendo in music, I re always relate to music. A crescendo in music, and the music gets louder and bigger. That's what was happening with my alcohols. It was getting louder. It was getting offensive, infectious. It was annoying people. And out of the gates, I wasn't really a happy drunk. I was angry about at God and for my mom leaving us like she did. And I hated my dad. It wasn't a good time. And I could keep pouring alcohol and escape for a little bit. I was the kid in the neighborhood whose mom committed suicide. I'm such an alcoholic, as painful as that was, I felt just as much pain that I was labeled the kid whose mom committed suicide and my reputation was ruined. Because it's all about me all the time. Totally self-centered to the core, self-seeking, self-absorbed. That turns out to be a very isolated and lonely life if I'm doing that in sobriety. And so my drinking assumed more serious proportions and I start to experience some consequences. You know, my younger brothers would tell my dad he came home drunk and disorderly again. And my dad would have these talks with me, and it wasn't like Father Knows Best where you sit by the fireside and he's sitting in the recliner with a pipe saying, well, son, how do you feel today? My dad would go anywhere on any street corner and he looked you right in the eye, read you the riot act, and you don't say anything until he's done. And you had to look him back in the eye because if you didn't eyeball him, that meant you were lying. And I'm always lying because I'm looking at my shoes. I was petrified of this man. But I'm an alcoholic, so I kept drinking and I kept stealing to get money for alcohol. I found my dad's checkbook one morning. And I had the brainstorm that if I take a check out of his checkbook and forge his name, I go down to the local bodega, they all knew him, they knew about him, I can cash this check. I'll try it, I'll get away with it. Again, I'll pay any price tomorrow to see comfort right now. And I walked in with a $20 check that I wrote out and forged his name. They kind of looked at me cockeyed, they cast a check, I thought I hit Powerball at this point, this was a great thing. I'm about as sharp as a bowling ball, I know nothing about checking statements. I thought you cash a check and it just vanished into space. So, and I walked out with beer. And I did this, I was doing this regularly, thinking it's okay to do, and one day I called the house and uh, my, my brother answered and he said, uh, what did you do now, the old, man is, the old man's gonna you know, really angry with you. I know what I did. But I'm thinking it's just a few hundred dollars. My dad's got plenty of money. He always walked around lots of money. What's a few hundred dollars? My alcoholism would not allow me to see that I just stole from my dad. It would justify, rationalize, and minimize every crime away. It didn't allow me to see compassion or have any kind of integrity. As long as I can get away with it, I'll do it again. And when I get caught, then I'm sorry. I'm not really sorry, just let me off the hook. <clears throat> and I went to my first treatment center. How I got there was, uh, I knew my dad was looking for me. And this is not the type of guy you want looking for you even when he's in a good mood. I mean, he doesn't smile when he's happy. That's the type of guy he was back then. And I'm sitting in lower Manhattan with this young lady I met the night before. And I'm sitting in this car. I got the windows down, the music up. My shirt's unbuttoned down in my navel because I think I'm a real catch. <clears throat> She's looking at me. I'm looking at her like you're with the player, you're with a real player. I got the Walmart jewelry going, you know. And I really think I'm something. And I met her the night before, so I'm in love, which is parallel, parallel stalking, because that's what alcoholics know, love and stalking is the same thing. And um, my dad rolls up, and he's looking for me. And he jumps out of the car and screams my name. I handle it like any player would, any man's man would. Honey, that's my dad, you talk to him, I gotta run away. And I ran out, started to run away. Yeah. And my dad caught me, and the very first thing I did was blame her and blame the guys in the neighborhood. And I threw out the trump card, it's mom. I'm all mixed up. I thought I was a nice guy who was misunderstood and overserved. I remember I had a sponsor, Mark H. out of Texas, and he says, if you think you're a nice guy, somebody dropped you on your head. You're not a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy. I'm not the hold you up with a gun guy. I'm not to get into a fist fight guy. I'm alcoholic, untreated. I'm not a good guy. I'm envious, I'm jealous. I'm a gossiper. I'm irresponsible. I have no consistency. 
All I want to do is get drunk and I'll step over you to get a bottle of whiskey. That's not a nice guy. I'm not a good guy. But Alcoholics Anonymous and God has kind of wakened the spirit. We have a little bit of integrity today. Some responsibility. Caring for other people. A heart of compassion and a servant's heart. I, that's not because I'm a good guy who walked into AA. That's just the power of God. Taking the dead and waking us up and making us walk again. In his light. In his way. No. Yeah. And so I went to my first treatment center. My dad put me in my first treatment center. And in the 28 day thing, neither one of us knew what treatment was. Someone told my dad, take your son to a treatment center. So off we go. And when we drove up, it was the same exact hospital that we took my mom to probably 20 times. It's just this private hospital in Long Island, New York, a psych hospital that had a treatment center in there. I think that was really sobering more than me being drunk. Oh my God, I'm picking up exactly where she left off. What's going on with me? And in 28 days in treatment, I did push-ups. I did sit-ups, you know. I went to the groups and identified my feelings. And all these people who worked in there were trying so hard to help me, but I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just doing time in here to get on my dad's good side and get the hell out of here. And 28 days later, I was discharged and drunk in an hour. I'm not alcoholic. And I'll tell you this, in my first uh, six treatment centers, uh, what I managed to accomplish on my own power was two days of continuous sobriety. From my first treatment center to the last treatment center, I was either drunk, locked up, or in the pursuit of alcohol and non-conference approved dry goods. I wasn't a 30-day guy, 60-day guy, 90-day guy, and went out again. Two days of continuous sobriety, and ironically, it was after my fifth treatment center. At the time, was the longest amount I stayed in there for nine weeks. I'd get out and be drunk in an hour, over and over and over again. The trap doors have trap doors. I had no idea how to do life. And the only thing, one of the things that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is a design for living that works to live life on God's terms, not life on life's terms, because for me, living life on life's terms, I need a double vodka to get out of bed, and I want more of everything. I'm a glutton, I'm prideful, I'm envious, I'm slothful, all of those things, living life on life's terms. God's terms are a little different, and a lot more inclusive for a guy like me. I was so wrapped up as I have been in Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm sober, alcoholism doesn't go away. It's still there. I have alcoholism, not wasm. But even in here, I would play a role that I think you wanted me to play just to get an attaboy out of you. I would pursue a goal or a dream that I thought was the right one to make me a man's man. And as both of those things were taking me further and further away from God the path God has on for me. But I only can see with my own eyes and I only can hear with my own ears. Which is usually tainted, fear-based, insecure, resentful, all of those things. It's a question I always ask guys I sponsor. You can see, yes, who's seeing? You can hear, but who's listening? And when you speak, who's speaking? Start to awaken and the, the I start to look at things differently, and the things I look at change. But back then it wasn't like that. I made my second, I made my third, fourth, and fifth treatments. And I got a job as a, a dock worker in, in, in South Brooklyn, a, a longshoreman, and it was the uh, Camelot era of this union, one of the biggest unions in the country, making lots of money. My whole family did that for a living, and I was brought in. And I had this really, really cushy job making lots of money. It was a job where if someone on the East Coast got fired, there'd be a wildcat strike all the way to California, a work stoppage for one guy getting fired. So you couldn't get fired from the job. The steamship companies didn't want any kind of headaches. You can never, ever, ever get fired from that job. I got fired from that job and there was no strike. In fact, they threw a party. They couldn't care. <laughs> And the reason why I got fired is because of what I was doing. My alcoholism was permeating every single area of my life. I was a thief. I took things that didn't belong to me, borrowed money, and never paid it back. Spirituality, if it doesn't touch every single area of my life, it touches none of my life because alcoholism got into every nook and cranny. Everything I did was alcoholic. And because I'm sober, that doesn't go away. It's probably even sharper and more dangerous. 
I got out, got into my fifth treatment center, and going into my fifth treatment center, I had marks all over my body from some other things. I can't stop drinking. I can't get off this other stuff. I'm in serious, serious trouble. I'm in serious trouble. I'm unemployed. There's no woman in her right mind who even wants to get 10 feet near me. And I start to steal and do a lot of illegal things just to get money for the price of a drink. And I got swooped up again and get into my fifth treatment center, really by the grace of God. And on the way in, I says, I'm done. This is it. I have a powerful desire to stop drinking. I find out in the big book, it says, it makes no avail. It might get me to a treatment center. It might get me to you to ask for you for help. But I need something for the long distance. I go into this fifth treatment center, and they hold on to me for nine weeks, which was pretty much unheard of back in the day. It was a 28-day thing. And after nine weeks of being in this treatment center, I'm physically sober, I'm bathing, I'm eating, I look, I got color in my face, I'm relatively human. And they discharge me on a Saturday morning. And I always had this feeling like, because I've, I've heard our stories where we get to meet our alcohols, we get to meet our demons eyeball to eyeball at some point. Whether it's our children saying, daddy or mommy, you're drunk again, or the police arresting us again, or an employee's, employer saying, I got to let you go again. We come face to face with that stuff. Nine weeks being physically sober in a treatment center. I'm healthy as can be. I still got hepatitis C. And I leave the treatment center. I hit the fresh air. And I suddenly I'm slapped in the face with alcoholism all over again. I start to get anxious. It's a Saturday morning in Amityville, Long Island. And people are going about their business. Saturday morning, people are doing chores, they're going here, they're going there, and no one stopped and said, Pete got out of treatment, let's hold up and give him a parade. It, they couldn't care. No one was interested. And it's going awfully fast, and all those voices in the head, you know, the voices in the head we have, they start talking too. You know, when I sit down and have my first cup of coffee, I think it's just me and God having a cup of coffee. There's about 45 other people up in that head having coffee with me, and they all have agendas for the day. They all have an itinerary for the day. They create ideas, attitudes, and emotions, which I'm going to walk out the door with. Even though I prayed, Moses, walk out the door, Rambo. <laughs> I had nowhere to go. I have no idea how to date. I've been running around with street folks. There's no dating. There's no courting on the street. She's got whiskey. I love you. And that was it. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. So I go back to my dad's house. He was living in an area called Staten Island, New York. I go back to my dad's house. And I stayed there for Saturday and Sunday. And I got to tell you, I couldn't even have, my dad's remedy for everything is a bowl of pasta. That fixes everything. He did that. And I, I couldn't even look at it. He tried to have a father and son chat. I couldn't hear him. I couldn't talk, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat because I'm wrestling with alcoholism. It's wrestling with me because one of those voices said, we need one drink, just one drink and we'll go to AA. Just take the edge off, settle the belly, stop the clammy forehead and hands, just get to a, a, a bottle of whiskey. One drink. Can't get a drink, get a bump, get a pill, get something, take the edge off. And on Monday morning, I couldn't take it anymore. And I had to sneak out of the house, it was like 5 a.m., and I jumped in a car and headed to South Brooklyn. My plan was, I'm gonna to go to the liquor store, get one pint of whiskey, and drive home. It's gonna be a great day. It'll be a great Monday driving home. And when I got there, nothing was open. I got out of the car and I started pacing up and down on the sidewalk, waiting for something to open, waiting for the sun to come up. As I'm walking up and down on the sidewalk, my belly is upside down. My forehead is sweating. My hands are starting to vibrate. I was not needing a drink physically, but the main problem sin is in the mind rather than the body. My mind screaming, we need a drink. Have you ever had the obsession so loud it begins to feel physical? Mm. And that's where I was. And when the liquor store opened, I ran in there and got a, a pint of whiskey and drank it down as fast as I could. And you know what happened? My be belly settled down. I felt okay. But I never made it to the car because I'm alcoholic and I need more alcohol. So I went back in and had to buy another pint of whiskey. I went on going on one of the worst drunks ever. I got in a lot of trouble on that, on that drunk and I didn't see it coming. Why would my alcoholism announce its arrival? Why would it say I'm going to turn the corner tomorrow and wreck your life? You better call your sponsor. It kind of just shows up. 
It'll show up in a relationship, no relationship, money, no money. It just shows up. And if I'm untreated, I give it, I give it carte blanche to wreck my life. And I start to believe I am alcoholism rather than I have alcoholism. Because if I am alcoholism, how can I get past that? How can I get better? I have alcoholism, it's killing me, and I wasn't seeking a God that can fix it. I was just gonna figure it out somehow, some way. And when I've learned if I always do what I always did, I'm always gonna get what I always got. And that's what I was doing, and I couldn't, it was so simple, and I couldn't see it, I kept missing it. I've been guilty of that in Alcoholics Anonymous, studying this book with good people, looking to cut the word in half, looking for some esoteric meaning, dividing the fourth step, you turn it into calculus, and it's right in front of me, most good ideas are simple. It's not that difficult. I was sitting outside before, it was beautiful, I was just sitting out there all alone. A couple of boats would go by. And right away, my mind's trying to interpret what's going on. That's how quick the mind gets in. And it'll turn into a bad movie in 10 minutes. <laughs> Rather than just being there and observing what's going on, you need to interpret anything. Because when I start interpreting and figuring out, I don't have room for God when I do that. I made it into my sixth treatment center. I walked out after 36 hours for a few reasons. First, I knew I'm a fraud. The voice in my head, you're a fraud, you're Peter Marinelli, who are you kidding? I was convinced at that point God had me in his crosshairs. There's gonna be a long suffering death. There was a point where I was laying in a flea bag motel in Staten Island, New York, and I ate about a half a bottle of Valium and washed it down with Jack Daniels because its courage to do battle was not there. I don't wanna live anymore. And when the Valium and the booze hit and you could feel it, and I'm drifting away, I realized at that moment, this is exactly how my mom went. And growing up, I thought suicide was a gender issue, that women do that, men would never do that. And I realized nothing to do with gender, it has everything to do with being alcoholic, because that's where my alcoholism takes me, I want to die. Mm. I don't want to go through a detox again. It's too painful. You know, my first time in treatment, I did detox standing on my head. It was a snap. But I'm 28 years old and I'm tore up from the floor up. I can't do it anymore. Coming off the booze, I don't care what kind of medication. At some point, they're going to cut the medication off. And I'm going to be uncomfortable. And if I go to one more group and identify my feelings, I'm feeling today, I'm going to throw a chair through a window. I can't do it. I just want out. AA is for special people, educated people, rich people, not for a street bum. I'm a bum. And I knew I would curse myself for being a weakling. I look at the bottle of whiskey and curse it and curse me because this little bottle of whiskey owns my life. And moreover, it took my family hostage. How arrogant of me to say all I have to do is today not drink and go to a meeting and I leave wreckage in my past. My dad and my brothers were heartbroken over and over and over again. My grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, all relationships, girls I cheated on, all of it. They were suffering from my alcoholism. I knew that. I knew my family despised me for what I had turned into and moreover I despised myself for what I had become. I got drunk at 14 years old, now I'm a scavenger in the street. I don't even care about bathing, I don't even care about uh, uh, eating. I want to die, that's it, I want out. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't go to this place called AA, they're too proper. You know back then if I, I used to go to meetings drunk and somebody would say I have two years, two years. Two whole years, how did you do two years without getting a little juice, a little buffer to go back out there? <clears throat> Life is, live a world of impermanence. Life hurts, it's unfair, it's problematic, even now. The only difference between then and me now is God and Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> I got that spiritual airbag, if you will. I got a new GPS. Because my knee-jerk reaction was if I can fix the causes of my alcoholism and if I could change you, I'll be okay. And what I've learned the hard way, like most of my lessons, I can't change anything out there and I forget the causes of my, my alcoholism. I need the results if I get to get to the causes. That means I had to take stock honestly and look in. Who wants to go all the way in the forest? I just want to peek in. That's enough. All the way in. 
And so 36 hours into this treatment center, I walked out. I remember the counselor sitting like you four here, and I'm sitting here, and they're throwing all kinds of statistics at me. They're pleading with me. You're going to drink. You're going to die. Don't do this. I was so rude to them. I was so arrogant. I basically told them what they can do with their information. I got, I got my bag and left and walked out, and I went right to a liquor store in Amityville, Long Island. And as our book says, Dust started one more journey to the asylum for Jim, another journey to hell for me, because I was repeating the same thing over again. I didn't even care at this point. It's really a frightening place to be where I don't care anymore. I don't care. I don't care when I was panhandling on the street. I remember the first time I panhandling, it was mortifying to do. After a while, it's what you do. And you're panhandling, you're homeless. Some people will give you money. Most curse at you, spit at you out the window, spit at you when they're walking by, step over you, caught a lot of beatings on the street. That I don't care. I really don't care. I'll take it. It's part of the price for the next drink. If I can get about five, ten bucks together, I'm good. I go back to the hallway, I'm good. I don't care. That's an awful place to be when passion for life is removed, which alcoholism loves to do. We just flatline. And then June 23rd, 1988 showed up. I didn't see sobriety coming. I didn't see God coming as I don't now. I don't see God coming. He kind of just shows up in a lot of unlikely places, like the, the unruly newcomer who reeks, and God says, go talk to him, and I go home better. Or making amends to someone that I really don't want to go there, and I go home better. But when God shows up, God shows up, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And one of the things I've walked away from for years now, knowing that I'm known by my creator, I'm just a drunken bum from Brooklyn, New York, and God thought enough of me to give me this gift called sobriety. I may not be significant to a lot of people, but in God's eyes, I'm incredibly significant. And that holds true for all of us. We're his most important project. And he's always in pursuit of me in pursuit of us. I just keep looking the wrong way. God's going to any lengths to take me from whatever I'm in to bring me to a place of ease and comfort so I can work for him and work on another drunk. I'm always looking in the wrong direction. I'm looking at the relationship. I'm looking at the money. I'm looking at the career. I'm looking at where I live. And God's not concerned with that. God's right in front of me. And so my sacred silence in the morning is important. My morning prayer meditation has really come down to a daily surrender. I have no right to tell God what I need today. Give me this and give me that. My prayer looks like a transaction and a negotiation. He already knows. God, I'm here to work for you. I'm surrendering everything to you. Keep me from playing your role today. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I work with the little religious practice because I'm a Catholic in the morning and I sit in sacred silence and meditation. I go in doctors to see and silence to hear. I need to get the soul operating because that always knows where to go, what to say and what to do. It's the head that gets in the way. It's the thinking that's always the problem. I don't know about you, but I, I get up at like five in the morning, almost on a dime. Get up at 5 o'clock and before my feet hit the floor, it's like 5 or 1, I'm already in a heated argument with someone that died 20 years ago. <laughs> well, I know how the day's going to play out. I know what they're going to say. And it's by 5 or 5, I'm Rambo again. Mm. I got to stay away from this as much as possible. Bring the body and the mind to follow. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't bring the mind around. Mm. When someone says, I'm going to go down to that store and give them a piece of my mind, give them the whole thing. You really don't need it. <laughs> You don't need it. Yeah. I know some guys would tell me the first three steps are conclusions of the mind. Conclusions of the mind, my conclusion, double vodka, we'll get, you know. But it's a walk of the soul, and that's why it makes me uncomfortable doing the step work. I'm being stripped away of everything I thought made me, me. And the longer I'm sober, my practice of the 11th step and working with others become paramount. Where am I with God tonight? How did I do this morning? And if he wakes me up, how am I going to do about that? What am I going to do with that? What am I going to do about this relationship with God? Nothing other than surrender. He already knows my intent and he knows my plan for me. It's become quite simple, actually, and incredibly liberating and freeing.
One of the greatest gifts I got here is I don't have to be anything other than what God created. You know, cracks in the armor and all. I'm broken, I'm flawed. That's my condition. Scripture says I'm weak flesh sold unto the slavery of sin. The things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I'm supposed to do, I don't. That's my condition. And God says that's perfect. And there's a tremendous amount of freedom in the aha moment when I come to, I'm broken and flawed. I'm going to say things I'm going to regret. I'm going to keep my mouth quiet when I should say something. It's really all okay. It's the humanness. I hope one day to get to a place where I can feel like a spiritual being. I hope one day to get to a place where I can feel like I'm an enlightened being. But one thing that's going to walk with me till God calls me home, and that's human being, which means I'm subject to breakdown at any moment, and God's okay with that. Because when I walk in here and tell you that, you say, we know, we got it. As soon as I say I'm alcoholic, you already know me. As soon as you say you're alcoholic, I got you. Different walks, different people, different parts of the world. We got each other. We already know. What tremendous freedom in that. Alcoholics Anonymous for me is the only place that I know of on the planet I can tell you about the most terrible, disgusting, awful things I've done. And you say, here's my number. Give me a call. Only an Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> that family that was ripped apart from uh, my alcoholism, little by slowly has uh, been put back together. My brothers start going to Al-Anon for a while. They found therapy, found the church. And they took care of their demons. And my brothers and I didn't talk for a long time. We were at, were at odds with each other because of what I was bringing to the house. My dad looked at me with skepticism and doubt for a long time. What Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me is, my dad and I have an absolutely wonderful relationship today. I got to see with new eyes my dad, as only my dad in the respect that's owed to him, but as a man, as a human being, who's flawed and knows it, who did the very best he could with what he grew up with. He grew up in the street. There was a code he brought home. I hated it for him, I love him now. In his way, he was trying to do the best he could. My mom, I always had a heart for, she's like me. She's alcoholic, she wanted to be the homemaker. She wanted to be the housewife. She wanted to attend all my ball games. She wanted to do a lot of things, but alcohol owned her. She may have had maybe 50 years by now, so who knows? But where she is, she don't drink anymore because she dines with the carpenter at night. So So that family has been little by slowly put back together. And there's a story, I don't know, maybe some, I'm getting nostalgic here, but there's a story that's coming to me about what what God does for a drunk like me. I wasn't in a blackout. I was in this this drunken, really drunken place, rageful and um, uh, screaming and crying at the same time, and I'm sitting on the edge of a bed, and um, I'm cursing God, blind drunk, cursing God for taking my mom and negotiating a deal with God. I said, if you, with some very ugly language, bring her back from wherever you got her, like he was holding a hostage, and put her in front of me and give me one hug with my mother, I will quit drinking. That's what I said. Because she, she, I went to sleep and she never woke up. I felt ripped off for a long time. I felt violated over that. That didn't happen. God never sent my mom back. But I got sober in 1988. And I'm working with the sponsor, going through the book. I'm having this step experience like a lot of us do. This personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And God is working in my life. And I'm convinced that everything's going okay. And I go into meditation. See, God had a way for the field to be ready. And when the field was fertile, God did some new growing. And I went into meditation one morning. And I'm sitting in meditation, and suddenly I'm taken to a beach. I was living up north at the time. I hate cold weather. I love being by the beach. I feel safe on the beach. I feel God can show off down there. And I can breathe when I'm at the beach. You could just look out forever. And God takes me to this beach, and I'm sitting there in the meditation. And I'm almost viewing myself in this meditation. And what starts to come towards me is my, my God, the carpenter's walking towards me. And as he gets close to me in this meditation, literally out of, a, out of his chest appears my mom. 
And the two of them walked towards me. And my mom kneeled down on one knee to give me a hug, and I became this little eight-year-old boy. Now, around ages eight to 10, I was being sexually abused. My mom was sick. A lot of bad things happened to me at that age. And we know, guys, at eight years old, five years old, when mama gives you a hug, you're gold. Nothing can touch you. And so my mom, in this meditation, kneeled down on one knee and gave me a mama's hug. And when she stood up, I became an adult, and she gave me another hug. I asked God for those hugs so far, so good. He's doing this in meditation. My mom's weeping. She got tears. They weren't sorrowful tears. They were joyful tears. And my higher power was standing to my left, and he put his arm around my shoulder. No words are spoken in this meditation, but he looks at me eyeball to eyeball. And I, if I tell you euphoria, peace, love, I mean, those words don't give it, an, uh, don't give it justice. It was beyond words. And what he said to me without saying a word is, she's okay, she's with me. And I remember feeling peace for the first time. And then my mom uh, did something. I had been lighting candles since I got sober. I was just moved to do that. Go to my church, light one candle for the sick and suffering in and out of the rooms, and another candle for my mom wherever she is. I did this faithfully once a week, was nine years doing this. Once a week, two candles. Once a week, two candles. Once a week, two candles. <clears throat> in this meditation, my mom points off to the horizon, to my right, and she points out hundreds upon hundreds of these flickering lights. And she pointed off to the other side, my left, and there were hundreds upon hundreds of flickering lights. My mom gave me another hug, and her and my higher power walked away, her and the carpenter became one, and I came out of this meditation. Till this day, I don't know if I was in there for five minutes or however long I was. Because when we get to that place, we can't make it happen, we kind of transcend time. There's no space, it's another place. They call it the world of the spirit in the big book. And as I came to, I realized I was weeping. I wasn't aware of that in meditation. So what do you do? You call your sponsor. And I explained to him what just took place. But I had an awake sponsor, not a sound asleep sponsor. Without missing a beat, he said to me, haven't you been lighting candles for your mom for about nine years? I says, yeah. He says, she let you know she got them. And in that moment, in that moment, it was one of those defining moments on this journey of recovery. I know that God knows me. Everything flipped. Have I had doubt and skepticism over the years? Absolutely. But it has been replaced with the uncertainty and doubt, with an undercurrent of, I don't know how I'm going to be okay, and I don't know when I'm going to be okay. I just know I'm going to be okay. And Jimmy and Mary Beth has been, have been with me in some of those valleys. I don't know how I'm going to get through this again. I just know I'm going to be okay. And what God does, he sends in the cavalry. He sends in friends to put you on their shoulders. That's what that was replaced with. The only thing God wants is my soul. I speak for myself on this one. And for me, step three is about giving this, this soul that I tore apart and giving it back to God and letting him fix it and put it back again. The only thing God wants is my soul. He doesn't want my money. It's his. He doesn't need my car. He doesn't drive. <laughs> he doesn't need my job. The only thing he wants is my soul because that's eternal. And that will take, when I'm gone, that'll keep going. The only thing he wants is the soul. And I give him my soul. And he's given me a life. And I give him my life. Every morning I surrender this to God. I will live for you and I will die for you. Whatever you want me to do, I will do today. And he keeps giving me purpose. I've given him all my sinfulness, even currently, day in and day out. I give him my sinfulness and he continues to give me forgiveness. I've given him my drunkenness and he's given me sobriety. I give him my sobriety every morning. I turn it over to God and he continues to give me the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and the men and women who are his soldiers to make sure I'm okay. And little by slowly, I chop wood and carry wood and try to carry the vision of his will into all my activities. Everything I have in my life, and I'm not embellishing here, everything I have, including the clothes I'm wearing tonight, my career, my relationship, my friends, where I live, my relationship with my dad, my brothers, the relationships I have, everything, my health, my doctor threw me out of his office, there's nothing wrong with you, get out of here. Everything 
I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous and God, and nothing less than that great fact. So I chop wood and carry wood and try to carry on this, to carry this message the way God sees fit for me to do it. I hope I brought you an AA meeting. That's all I got. Peace.